Hi there. It's good to see you again. Do you know anything about the Ming Dynasty? Did you know that at its peak, the Ming Dynasty made China a global superpower? But what happened? Why did that dynasty fall after almost 300 years in power? And why did China institute a policy of isolationism? Well, that's our lesson question today. So let's get started. Let's take a look at our goals for this lesson. To start off with, we're going to learn about China's Ming Dynasty. Then we're going to describe the achievements of the Ming Dynasty. We're going to explain why Ming officials instituted a policy of isolationism. And we're going to identify factors leading up to the decline of the Ming Dynasty. Next, we'll take a look at today's lesson's vocabulary words. Take a moment to write these important words into your e-notes and be sure to check the definitions in your glossary. Keep your eyes peeled for them as you move through the lesson. And don't forget the green words are words you see throughout all of your lessons and the purple words are specific to this lesson. We have comprehensive, corrupting, expedition, isolation, kowtow, and missionary. So let's jump right in. Today's lesson question is, why did China institute a policy of isolationism? Well, in order to understand that, we'll be looking at the Ming Dynasty, Chinese isolationism, and the decline of the Ming Dynasty. The Forbidden City served as the imperial palace under the Ming Dynasty and served as the home of the emperors. It's located in Beijing and is now a museum complex. This Ming scroll depicts the Forbidden City. When you look at it, notice how the artist designed it to move the eyes heavenward and upward toward the sky. It's known for its golden bricks and paths, and it was built and maintained as a place of wealth where religious and government ceremonies were held. But why is it called the Forbidden City? Well, that's what you're going to learn in this lesson. So let's dive in and take a look at the Ming Dynasty. So looking back to our lesson question, why did China institute a policy of isolationism? We need to start by looking at the man who founded the Ming Dynasty. First, let's take a look at the territory the Ming Dynasty covered. Be sure you understand that this is a vast territory, especially in relation to the neighboring territories. There was Taiwan, Mongolia, China, India, and Korea. In fact, there were two capitals during the dynasty. We have Nanjing and Beijing, where the capital finally ended up moving permanently. Hong Wu was the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty. He established the Ming Dynasty in 1368. He was the son of a peasant family, but joined a resistance group working to end Mongol rule. He drove the Mongols out of China, and he's best known for restoring order to China by not only driving out the Mongols who had ruled since 1279, and he restored Chinese traditions. The thing to remember is, he restored many important Chinese traditions, but he did so with absolute authority. And one of these traditions was the Confucian system of government. Hong Wu reintroduced the Chinese system of government based on Confucian ideals. This is important because this is the same system that was also used in the Han Dynasty and in the Tang Dynasty. Hong Wu reintroduced Confucian system of government and civil service examinations determined who filled government positions. Education based on Confucianism set high standards of behavior for government leaders. Virtuous people were expected to accept their place in society, thereby producing harmony and order. Candidates were highly trained in Confucian principles. Not only highly trained, but government officials were required to study Confucianism. A strong military was also created, and a strong military and government prevented rebellion. This was important as the Mongols still represented a threat to China. With a strong government in place, the economy grew, and a comprehensive code of laws was also developed. China had a strong economy for many reasons. China did not need to import many goods it had plenty of natural resources. 
It also had a strong agricultural base, so there was always plenty of food. China also had highly skilled artisans who produced high-quality finished goods, everything from silk to porcelain. And these were very valuable on the world market. Expanding world trade along the Silk Road and later by ship meant more customers for Chinese goods. And more exports meant fewer imports. China didn't need anything. So our big idea here is China was growing very wealthy as a result of trade, and that trade was rapidly increasing in the 14 and 1500s. But does a wealthy economy fit with Confucian ideals? Next, take a moment to read what Confucius had to say about the economy. The young law emperor was the son of Hong Wu. He thought it was important to increase China's wealth and influence. That sounds reasonable. The Ming emperor sponsored a series of expeditions to discover foreign lands. Zhang He was, interestingly, a Muslim and a skilled navigator. Zhang He commanded an impressive fleet of ships. He sailed highly advanced ships, some as large as a football field, five to six times larger than the ones used by Columbus to sail to the Americas. And he sailed throughout the Indian Ocean as far as Africa. He traveled to Africa and brought back goods and animals to China, including the giraffe. He also spread Chinese culture and encouraged other countries to buy Chinese goods. In a series of seven voyages between 1405 and 1433, he traveled widely, reaching as far west as Africa. Hey, don't forget that Europeans would not be able to sail around Africa until 50 years later. China's accomplishments in exploration and navigation were impressive, but they would not last. You know, you're really rocking along here. Keep up the good work. So getting back to our lesson question, why did China institute a policy of isolationism? Well, you now know that the Ming emperor reintroduced the Confucian style of government with civil service exams to identify the best people for government positions. And you also learned about the great Chinese explorer, Zhang He. He traveled all the way to Africa, but his voyages would have some unexpected consequences. It seems like China was far ahead of Europe when it came to exploring the world. So how did Europe take the lead? As the age of exploration got underway, trade increased between China and the West. Trade between China and the West increased between the 1500s and the 1600s. Europeans were interested in high-quality finished goods from China, and missionaries traveled to China to spread the Christian faith. But this increased contact with the West worried Chinese officials. Ming officials believed that increased trade was corrupting Chinese culture. The Chinese believed that China was a superior nation and culture. They believed that Western and foreign ideas were inferior to their own. This image illustrates the Chinese trade with the outside world prior to the 1500s. This is the giraffe that Zhang He brought back from his travels. China's change of heart was also in response to the voyages of Zhang He, which Confucian leaders felt were too expensive and too dangerous to Chinese culture. They feared that Christian religion was harming Confucian traditions. And they wanted to preserve a traditional agricultural economy. Increased trade with Europe would result in more people manufacturing silk, china, etc., instead of people growing food. As a result, the Chinese government decided to limit contact with foreigners. The Chinese policy of isolation to protect China from the outside influences. So we started off with the limited number of Western goods brought into the country. And it restricted the access of Westerners, including traders and missionaries. And it was also continued under the Qing Dynasty. But perhaps nothing symbolizes the Ming isolation more than the Forbidden City. The Forbidden City in Beijing was constructed during the Ming Dynasty. It was home to the emperor and his family. Construction lasted 14 years and required more than a million workers. And no foreigners were allowed to enter. In fact, no foreigner or commoner could enter without special permission. 
So let's take a moment to review what you've learned so far. To maintain Chinese security and limit foreign influence, new trade rules were established during the Ming Dynasty. Trade was only allowed at three Chinese ports. Foreigners had to pay tribute. Tribute is the gifts of money or goods to Chinese officials. And foreigners had to acknowledge the superiority of the Chinese emperor by kowtowing. To win access to trade, foreign diplomats were required to kowtow to the emperor to recognize his authority. Kowtowing means kneeling three times and touching your head to the floor nine times. And this picture, it shows people kowtowing in a Chinese court. Court officers were representatives of the emperor. In later years, Western representatives would resist the kowtow and eventually it was abolished for Westerners. China was not completely closed off during the Ming Dynasty. Trade did occur, but it was more limited to specific trading partners. Trading partners included Portugal, the Netherlands, Japan, Russia, and neighboring communities along the western and northern borders. And there were other communities, civilizations, and cities along the Silk Road, like Tibet, for example, that were also trading partners with China. So let's take a look at this graphic organizer and we can see what was exported and what was imported. So copper coins and luxury goods such as silk and porcelains went out of China and pepper and other spices and similar rarities flowed in. Now on the western and northern frontiers, especially along the Silk Road, the main exchange was in Chinese tea and step horses. So let's look at turning points. Do you know what one is? Do you know why they're important in the study of history? A turning point is an event marking a unique or important historical change of course. It can be an event or a deliberate decision made by someone in power. You have your original path, a turning point, and now a new path with new effects. For example, you can use the fall of Constantinople. Originally, it was a Christian city the center of Orthodox Church and heavily influenced by Greek culture. After its fall, Turkish Muslims came in and it is now more heavily influenced by Arab culture and its name is now Istanbul. A few years ago I visited the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul and it had once been a Christian church that was converted to a mosque during that particular turning point in history. So, in the 1500s, China was as rich and powerful as any European power. But it was a critical time. Europeans were investing more and more money into exploration, discovery, and eventually colonization. Chinese leaders decided that spending on exploration was a waste of money. So, when we look at our graph here, Europe says yes to exploration. The Spanish would conquer the Americas, making them wealthy. The British would build a vast trading empire and industrialization would spread across Europe. China, however, cut itself off. China said no and its wealth began to decline. The country didn't get the benefit of new technologies and began to fall behind. And as a result, in the 1800s, China was no match for the Europeans and was forced to sign unequal trade agreements. It was no longer one of the world's most powerful nations. Next, you'll learn more about the effects of this decision. So why did China institute a policy of isolationism? Well, you now know why the Ming Dynasty instituted a policy of isolationism, and you understand that this had an important effect on both China and Europe. Next, we'll look at what contributed to the decline of this dynasty. Let's take a look at the factors that contributed to the decline of the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty began to weaken in the 1600s. Emperors were ineffective. It was very difficult for one person to rule such a vast territory. Bad harvests led to famine. People were getting angry with the government and with the lack of food due to the poor harvest. And economic problems were caused by declining trade. People were out of work and the money of the Ming Dynasty began to lose its value. Many factors led to the decline of the Ming Dynasty. 
So let's learn about the final cause of the decline of the Ming Dynasty and the rise of another group, the Manchu. A group of people from the north called the Manchu began to rise in power. They were joined by peasant rebels who were starving and angry about high taxes. Many people, including peasants, were upset with the government of the Ming Dynasty. Therefore, they decided to join forces to rebel against the government. The Ming Dynasty collapsed. The Manchu saw this as an opportunity to come in and overtake the Ming. And the Manchu created a new dynasty, the Qing. It was easier for Manchus to overtake the Ming dynasty because many Ming, including the peasants, were upset with the current government and economic situation in the dynasty. So now it's your turn to check your understanding of the decline of the Ming dynasty. Let's take a look at the time period you've been learning about in this lesson. Keep in mind that the Ming dynasty ruled China for almost 300 years. That is between 1368 and 1644. And remember, Zheng He made his last voyage in 1433. Did you know that Vasco da Gama became the first European sailor to reach India? This would begin to increase trade in the Indian Ocean and increase European exploration in Asia. And the Tokugawa shogunate comes to power in 1603. A lot was going on in the world as China kept to their isolationist policies.